I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today's episode is a panel from our conference, Rewriting the Future, 100 Years of Esoteric Modernism and Psychoanalysis. This panel was given on June 1st at Brunenburg Castle in Murano, Italy. First, we have Siegfried de Rauschewitz presenting a welcome introduction to the Brunenberg, and then his talk on Ezra Pound and Joseph Ennemoser and animal magnetism. Next, we have Katrina McCook giving her talk, Pound's Occultism, the Development of Automatic Writing and Occult Philosophy in the Pisan Cantos. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Published by Trapart Books, 2019, and also available as an ebook through iBooks and Kindle. For more information, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T R A P A R T.net. You may also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, and the podcast website, renderingunconscious.org. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. The first part of it will consist simply in trying to explain a little bit where we are and why, why you are here, ultimately. Uh, and only then, the second part, I will read from my paper on animals. Uh, you see, for many years, 21 to be exact, uh, I was a director of the Schloss Tirol Museum, which... I had the privilege of actually building and constructing uh, literally as a history or cultural history museum, something that was actually missing from our landscape. But uh, it was sort of a challenge in the sense that when in 1972 uh, Schloss Tirol, the cradle of this geopolitic a political entity known as Tyrol, from which it gets its name, was transferred from the Italian government to the local authorities, the Autonome Province Bozen. As usual, the politicians had no idea really uh, what to do with it. They had clamored for it and they wanted it back and so on, but once they had it, uh, they really didn't know, you know, what shall we do with it. So it went through uh, various stages of they tried to make a kind of a mixed bag, uh, put in some archaeology, put in some contemporary art, and so on. And then in 1991, anyway, I was sort of upcommandeered from the Denkmalamt, the Department of the Preservation of Monuments here in the local province. Uh, and, you see, I had a big ally because that very same year, Ötzi decided to emerge from the ice. <laughs> and, of course, that he was my greatest ally to the extent that it was, became suddenly clear that Schloss Tirol was not suitable for an archaeology museum in the classical sense because it would mean one would have to go back to prehistory, to periods that, of course, preceded the building and preceded the Middle Ages, not to speak of the whole 
technical question that, of course, something like that needs to be in an urban context with all the technology that is available. The second um, stroke of luck, you know, I do believe in Hermes and the lucky find. <laughs> and so uh, the local, um, uh, yes, fire department came to me because there had been some fires, Buckingham Palace, etc., etc. And they said, look, we don't have enough water here at Schloss Tirol in case of a fire. So you must build a reservoir and we started digging. But of course, anywhere where you started digging around Schloss Tirol, all kinds of things started to come to the surface, uh, which meant, no, you can't dig here, you can't dig here. So we kept going further south, down into the vineyards. And finally, I thought we were going to be safe because it was all vineyards. And sure enough, for about two and a half meters, nice humus, earth, and so on. And then at three meters level, suddenly, a circle, a semicircle. Obviously, what seemed to be the abscess of a little chapel. Well, uh, all right, everything stopped. Hand digging, so for two years, scraping away at it. Well, the end, what it turned out to be, was not a little chapel. It was actually a free absidal church, the oldest of which was actually one of the earliest Christian churches that we know in South Tyrol, meaning 4th, 5th century uh, AD, and, uh, you know, quite a uh, spectacular find because nobody knew of the existence of such a church at that place. There was no record, no written record, no oral tradition, nothing. Well, uh, it left us again with all kinds of open question marks because we found the tombstone of a mysterious lady. Uh, we assume she was a lady, maybe she was a child. Lobezena Alba Deposita. It was one of the, again, very rare pieces uh, of actual a written document, you might say, from 5th, 6th century. But one also saw the church later had been expanded in Carolingian times and had existed up until more or less the year 1000 when it suddenly disappeared. The, or at least the great parts of the walls were taken off and that coincided with the building of then Schloss Tirol, which is a different story altogether and I won't go into that. The reason I've mentioned these two things, Ötzi and the uh, Paleo-Christian Church is that whenever I would stand in front of the castle and try to explain to my visitors, you know, where we are and why this place is so important, it wasn't just a matter of the strategic importance of the fact that the Via Claudia Augusta, the Roman road, used to coast the mountains here and that you could sort of imagine uh, these uh, Roman troops and probably then the, ro the first missionaries coming along these roads and then the wine trade coming through, crossing the Alps, all of that. But in fact, much before, this, holy e this whole area must have been a holy precinct because we find beginning from the menhirs that were found just at the foot of Schloss Tyrol, these big uh, two really extraordinary remains of what must have been once a very large megalithic culture here, uh, which was to a large extent, of course, destroyed by the new religion coming in. Uh, some of these men here were then actually, one of them was found in the Finchgau, uh, upside down, used as an altar plate. Mm -hmm. So the message was quite clear, right? And we did have all kinds of recordings, you know, of these missionaries coming here and saying, you know, the people here still insist on venerating stone idols and things like that. Uh, so whether we go back to, shall we say, the Bronze Age, which, to which these men here belong, or whether you were to take a long hike up to the seven lakes which lie behind these mountains here, where we actually have something that, with some exaggeration, but not too much, one could call the Stonehenge of the Alps. The fact is that it is an ex 
very, very large expanse, but tourists fortunately just walk over it and don't really realize what they're walking over it because it's just a big field of cupstones. Mm -hmm. And these cupstones are distributed over a very large area. And, you know, people who have had the courage, shall we say, to work also with some hypotheses, not our normal archaeologists, they won't touch it. Mm -hmm. They make a long, you know, it's like Mark Bloch saying the historians have made a long detour around the Misthäufende uh, Geschichte, the manure piles of history, uh, which of course I don't as an agro-historian, but uh, the fact is uh, the archaeologists do tend to make a big detour around such things that do, they cannot explain, and this is one of them, but the really you know, most serious and really not that original, shall we say at this point, uh, observation is that this must have been used as a uh, astronomical observatory because it was obvious that when uh, that they were watching the phases of the moon, it was a calendar. You might just call it, you know, like Hesiod's the way it works in the days, a, a farmer's almanac. But of course, the farmer's almanac contains other things as well. You know, what is when is the right day to take your cows to the bull? When is the right day to sow? And so you have this mixture of, you know folk tales in Tyrolean uh, tradition where uh, it's always the Saligan, these fairy women that will come and tell the farmer, okay, power yet san, it's get the paradise wind, which means uh, farmer go out and sow because there is a wind blowing from paradise, which was this ancient notion that the doors of paradise sometimes just open just a little bit and when that air comes, that wind comes through, it is like Feng in the cantos, a positive wind, a fertile wind, a wind that will bring uh, growth. So anyway, uh, all of this simply to uh, indicate that throughout these many centuries uh, there has been a continuity of human presence on these sunny terraces Right here, Brunenburg uh, again has its own stories that indicate some perhaps cult of the house snake, which was, I mean, I've collected so many stories here in this particular region that one could do an interesting comparison, for example, with Lithuania, Lithuania where the cult of the house snake was still very alive, even some 30 years ago, at least the dissertation was written on it and so on. So, uh, you know, here it's, uh, it's the story that a young shepherdess uh, stands in front of Brunenburg and looks after her goats, shepherdess, goat her, and uh, anyway, a little snake comes by and every day she gives her a little bit of milk, which is pretty much the same story at the beginning of uh, um, of, of Virgil's Aeneid, where there is an offering is made with of milk, and the house snake comes and drinks of it because the house snake ultimately represents the uh, the, uh, the lares and so on. And so this something similar must have gone on here. The little snake is grateful for the milk she gets and beckons the girl to follow her. You might try it, and uh, and then you somewhere down here. There is a cave, and the little girl goes inside the cave and finds uh, great treasures, and anyway, she's, she's, she's all right for the rest of her life. There are variations of this story which are, are a little bit more moralizing and so on. But again, uh, the point being, uh, there is uh, Apichlos Tirol uh, we found, or we didn't because this preceded my time, uh, was found a statue of Isis Fortuna, which is a clear indication that in Roman times there was probably some higher official stationed up there to make sure that the tolls from the Tull, which is still called Tull today, so it's, uh, the tolls would be collected and 
uh, other things, of course, administrative things, but being belonging to a certain higher class, he was a follower of ISIS, and you know we know that the ISIS cult was reserved uh, to a certain level of class, and we have, of course, the Mitras stone right uh, across there, uh, quite a few uh, indications that uh, Jove uh, was venerated on the mountain passes here, and uh, we have a Diana uh, statue, fragment of a statue from Parchins. So this entire area here essentially has always been used uh, or has been the occasion for some form of cult, for some form of prayer, religion, uh, whatever. And uh, that, to my mind, makes it particularly interesting to be here and to uh, talk about things that may have to do with spiritualism and uh, mystical traditions and so on. Uh, both Brunnenberg, uh, which I remember my father was actually seriously digging here at the, in the cellars of this castle because one of the many legends, I've only told you one about this snake, but the other legend says there is a golden calf buried at the Anderschloss, Anderschloss Brunnenburg. The golden calf motif, by the way, recurs in a number of Tyrolean folk tales. And uh, there is only one night uh, in the Johannesnacht, this golden calf actually will appear, but it is guarded by two giants. And these two giants, uh, they don't do any harm, but they do like this with their fingers. And of course, if you are scared, then like everything, you know, the treasure will disappear. So it must have happened once before. Anyway, the treasure disappeared. <laughs> and uh, anyway, my father uh, thought that he would dig at the bottom of here. The idea was to actually to see if there was anything to it. Like the, every castle has the tradition that there is an underground passage connecting it to the other castle, which of course geologically is totally out of the question here. Uh, but you know, you know, uh, these are things that uh, that one does, and uh, it's great fun for children to be able to partake in such uh, treasure hunts. On a more serious basis, uh, Boris de Rahevils was actually himself uh, quite interested in esoteric teachings, um, of course, coming from the, as an Egyptologist, he dealt mostly, he wrote books about uh, Egitto Magico Religioso, about Egyptian magic, and this comes into play into the cantos, because when Pound then arrived here in 1958, he had in my father a conversation partner who would actually talk about such things and who would be able to tell Pound something new about a mythology that he had not at that point known that well, namely ancient uh, Egyptian mythology. And so we find then Kati and a number of, of, of references that go back exactly to the Egitto Magico Religioso. On the other hand, <clears throat> we have had, uh, or my father uh, invited people like Marius Schneider, uh, who for musicologists is a particularly interesting name because he had, uh, Marius Schneider wrote Singende Steine, and he has basically, he discovered uh, a kind of a hidden uh, code, musical code, in the architecture of certain Spanish uh, Romanesque uh, Kreuzgänge. Uh, and uh, anyway, and has uh, sort of made connections between the symbolism, medieval musical symbolism of these, uh, of these cloisters with actual ancient Indian uh, mu musicological symbology. And uh, Elemire Zolla, uh, another name that perhaps is known to some of you anyway, uh, a founder of the uh, uh, Studi Religiosi, a, one of the few Ita serious Italian reviews that has actually 
uh, translated, he translated the teachings of Don Juan, uh, introduced a lot of the uh, Mesoamerican, Mexican, uh, Indian. Again, Pound too was very interested in Native American folk tales. In fact, one of the first things he had me do while he was still back there was to translate Jaime de Angulo's Indians in overalls. And Jaime de Angulo, again, a fascinating character to be rediscovered because he has unfortunately been largely ignored, especially in his native California. But uh, there was there a little Turtle Island press which was bringing out again these wonderful little books by Jaime de Angulo who was essentially anthropologist, linguist, but then went to Taos and became a group, part of that group in Taos. All right, so here just a few very sundry connections from uh, the Brunnenburg, as it were, visitor's book. Uh, I could uh, continue, and I hope you will all sign the visitor's book uh, before you leave this evening. And now I am about to, you know, just, uh, let's see, yeah, uh, to um, embark on, on something. This chair is, 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 is a little bit wobbly. And so a few years ago, uh, up at Schloss Tirol, we did an exhibition called Für Freiheit, Wahrheit und Recht, uh, Josef Ennemoser und Jakob Philipp Falmeraya. Now these two characters, Falmeraya and Ennemoser, really represent, as it were, some of the most fascinating intellectuals that have come out of this region. But as you can well imagine, they were not popular at all during their daytime. In fact, they were regarded as public enemies, as traitors, etc., because uh, they did not, uh, shall we say, simply uh, fit in into that clerical conservative power mesh, which, you know, Tyrol being uh, in the words of Goeres, Josef Goeres, and his Münchner Gottseligen, it was a Catholic fortress, and it was to remain such, and no Protestant should ever set foot or get to own a piece of land here. Uh, no Jew, no other believer should ever taint this immaculate, uh, as it were, uh, region which was largely identified with a what the most popular, uh, shall we say, personage, but also site that was visited in the 1830s. There were three of them. One was Schloss Tyrol, of course, as the palladium of this country. Uh, then it was, was the house of the birth house of Andreas Hofer, which, of course, the freedom fighter. And the third was... Maria von Merle. Maria von Merle was this young lady from Kaltern who had received these the stigmate, stigmatized, one of these stigmatized virgins, and she was, as it were, turned into an icon of this Catholic Tyrol that would not, uh, you know, all around, you know, the, the Kaiser was making concessions to religious tolerance and so on, not in Tyrol. <laughs> anyway, well, things have changed a little, but in a diff not necessarily in a better way. <laughs> All right, uh, I will try to just stay within limits and stop when the clock stops. This is about Enemoser and about what Pound, Yates, and Enemoser actually, what joins, uh, connects these three very different characters. In, the November, in November 1913, William Butler Yeats was getting ready to spend a few months in a small country house about an hour south of London in Stone Cottage, far from the maddening crowd, which of course is not the maddening crowd, but that's a different story. He helped to find, he hoped to find new inspiration, catch up on some reading and work on some esoteric projects the elucidations to Lady Gregory's visions and beliefs in the west of Ireland, and two essays 
witches and wizards and Irish folklore and Swedenborg mediums and the desolate places. For conversation and secretarial functions, he had invited a young American colleague who had caused quite a splash with his iconoclastic ideas on art and poetry. He was one of the many admirers of the Irish bard, even though he did not share his fascination with spiritism and the occult at that time. Since Yeats' uh, eyesight, my own eyesight is, alas, not at the best, so I excuse if sometimes I hesitate here. Uh, since Yeats' eyesight was bad, Ezra Pound was asked to read out aloud to him in the evenings from books that Yeats had brought along, including some from his vast esoterica collection. Pound at first had feared that the dealings with the occult would take up much of their time, but as it turned out, these uh, secret things coincided with his own interests much more than he had expected. At Stone Cottage, he had planned to translate some Japanese no plays sent to him by Ernest Fenolosa uh, and Ernest Fenolosa's widow. These medieval plays revolve around the apparition of ghosts and otherworldly beings from Japanese mythology. Obviously, uh, this kind of material appealed greatly to Yeats as well. But neither of them could have foreseen that the no plays would help Yeats find a new dramatic voice and influence all his subsequent work, causing that creative breakthrough which later led to his success and renown, Nobel Prize in 1923. Among the books brought along were Montfaucon's Des Villars, Comte de Gabalis, Robert Kirk's The Secret Commonwealth, and Joseph Enemoser's The History of Magic, 1670, 1691, 1854. Many years later, near Pisa, Pound would reminisce, reminisce about those quiet days in Sussex and about Joseph Enemoser. Quote, At Stone Cottage in Sussex, by Waste Moor, or whatever, and the holly bush who would not eat ham for dinner because peasants eat ham for dinner, despite the excellent quality and the pleasure of having it hot, well, those days are gone forever, and the traveling rug with the coon skin tabs, and his hearing nearly all of Wordsworth for the sake of his conscience, but preferring Enemoser on witches. <laughs> this refers, of course, to Yeats. Pound, remembering his somewhat snobbish friend, disdaining peasant food, listening to nearly all of Wordsworth, uh, out of a sense of duty, yet really much more interested in Enemoser's history of magic, as it deals profusely with prophecy, witchcraft, and the persecution of witches and wizards. Enemoser's 1,001-page book appeared in Leipzig in 1844, and ten years later in William Howitt's English translation. William Howitt uh, and his wife Mary Botham deserve a footnote here as they offer us a glimpse on the particular brand of British esotericism. They both started out as Quakers. Williams published a popular history of priestcraft in 1833. Mary translated Hans Christian Andersen. After a period spent in Germany, where they probably got acquainted with Enemoser's work, they returned to England and devoted themselves more, or more and more to mesmerism and to the occult in general. They consorted with the Rossettis, Dante Gabriel and his sister Christina, with Alfred Lord Tennyson and with Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and corresponded with Dickens and Wordsworth. 
In 1852, William Howitt set sail for Australia in the wake of the gold rush there. On board, he translated the history of magic and later sent the manuscript to Mary for proofreading. She did more than that. She added a lengthy appendix of the most, quote, of the most remarkable and best authenticated stories of apparitions, dreams, second sights, somnambulism, predictions, divinations, witchcraft, vampires, fairies, table turning, and spirit rapping. Uh, upon his return, uh, William organized seances with Daniel Douglas Home, a famous medium, and the Howitts spent their latter days actually here in the Tyrol, curiously uh, enough not far from Geis. Mary Howitt is still remembered for her famous children's poem, The Spider and the Fly. Anybody know it? So much for Animoser's translators. Although Pound could not muster much enthusiasm for popular forms of spiritism and the occult, he had begun to apply some fundamental ideas of medieval mysticism, alchemy, even of mesmerism and magnetism to his own poetics, as shown in a number of poems predating Stone Cottage. In Mesmerism, written in 1909, he addresses Robert Browning as ye old mesmerizer and prays tribute to his ability to summon the souls of great men and having them speak in his dramatic monologues. In Paracelsus in Excelsis, 1911, the quote, sidereal spirit rises to the eternal peace of celestial bodies as an untangible fluid. Quote, and we that are grown formless rise above fluids intangible that have been men. <coughs> Pound finally became an alchemist and necrom necromancer himself, in the alchemist attempting to conjure up all the lost beauty through the magic of language. At this time, he was forging a new poetical credo, which was to rid poetry of the blurred and trite language of, late, of the late Romantics. Through, through clarity and precision, poetry would regain the liberating force and healing power of a divine epiphany, which it had with Dante and the troubadours. The no plays and the readings in Stone Cottage played an important role in this process. And so it came that the Tyrolean physician and natural philosopher Josef Enemoser was indirectly godfather to the birth of the first poetical avant-garde movement of the 20th century. As James Langenbach has pointed out, the growth of imagism depended on Pound's reading of Montfaucon, Kirk, and Enemoser's History of Magic. It was probably Enemos's clear ethical stance, his fearless intellectual curiosity, and his deep respect for the clairvoyance, the clearer vision of the pagans, the Heller, Sehen, den Heiden, which appealed to Pound. Otherwise, he would not have recommended the history of magic to his fiancée when trying to explain to her quote, the profounder sense of symbolism, unquote. In that same letter, he tells her that, quote, a symbol appearing in a vision has a certain richness and power of energizing joy. Something similar to what Enemoser intends when he speaks of the positive, imminent, vital force of symbols. Pound he and Pound both shared the notion that myths arise out of the attempt to communicate through symbols otherwise unexplainable visionary experiences. Let me just take a look. You must ring the bell. Yes. <laughs> Never. <laughs> the points in common are many. Uh, time here will not allow a detailed analysis, but compare, for example, Enemoser's quote, a hospital should be a place, should 
should be like a place of worship. Uh, I can speak of that, having been there in a week, a week ago. Uh, a, a hospital should be like a place of worship, for only then will we be able to regain the healing priesthood of earlier days. Everybody carries in himself the power to magnetize, but one needs power combined with wisdom in order to apply it. This is animal. For Pound, it is the artist, it is the artist who embodies both visionary and healing powers, seen as the antenna of the human race. Quote, because he associates with gods, the poet is responsible for other human beings. And speaking of Brancus, Brancusi, uh, saint and alchemist, quote, perhaps every artist at one time or another believes in a sort of elixir or philosopher's stone produced by the sheer perfection of his art, by the alchemical sublimation of the medium. The foe or the problem that has to be confronted is desensitization, loss of perception. Animoser, quote, everything merely superficial, is unpoetic and irreligious. And in Canto 34 derides the superficial trivialization of animal magnetism by the American middle class, uh, which was, you know, very in in those days. Uh, in the 1850s, this was happening in the 1850s, he himself, on the other hand, resorts to magnetic imagery only when trying to convey the utmost intensity of perception, as in the image of the rose in the steel dust in Canto 74. This liquid is certainly a property of the mind, neck accidents, but an element in the mind makeup, est agens and functions dust, in the fountain pen otherwise. Hast thou seen the rose in the steel dust, or swans down ever, so light the urging, so ordered the dark petals of iron, we who have passed over Lethe. Pounds, world unchanging, the world of fine animal life, the world of pure form, what the Neoplatonists sometimes called the anima mundi, Animoser, referring to Plotinus and Porphyry, writes, What the ancients called anima mundi is what we call magnetism, <clears throat> a universal cosmic force of nature. A Christ, as Christian and Neoplatonists, he adds, An inner secret poet leads humanity with an unfailing thread through the labyrinth of space and time. In our breast lie hidden the eternal messenger, messengers of heaven and hell. And later, God is within us, not outside of us. To which Pound's echo, quote, all is within us, purgatory and hell. Again, what matters is the quality of perception the ability to perceive the radiant, quote, the radiant world where one thought cuts through another with clean edge, a world of moving energism, magnetisms that take form, that border the visible, the matter of Dante's Paradiso, the glass underwater, from the literary essays. This leads to the tradition of undivided light, to the genealogy of light, to Plotinus, Psellos, Grosstest, Bacon. Enemosers quoting Plotinus, the eye would never see the sun if it were not of the nature of the sun, helio eides. Plotinus is described as a great healer, 
who has command over images, shapes, and spirits that flow unceasingly from God's eternal fountain of life. Again, animal, sir. And in Canto 91, in the green deep of an eye, crystal waves weaving together towards the great healing. And Enemosa in the history of magic, procreation is more than just symbolically a projection of light into the darkness of night. The signatures in nature, Canto 87. In nature, there are signatures needing no verbal tradition, oak leaf, never plain leaf. This is from John Hayden. John Hayden's English Physician's Guide, or A Holy Guide, 1667, was among the books in Yeats' library. Hayden took the doctrine of divine signatures in plants and minerals from Paracelsus, God placing signatures on plants and minerals in order to signal their healing properties to the sorry to the adepts. Enemosus got got it via Jacob Böhme, another favorite of his of Yeats, the shoemaker from Görlitz, tells his followers that in order to see God and to recognize the signatures in nature, they have to become nothing to themselves and poorer than a bird. Finally, E.P.'s common rejection of all form of religious and non-religious fanaticism. Pound chastises, quote, the asceticism that is anti-flesh, followed by the asceticism that is anti-intelligence. In the history of magic, Enemosers condemns any form of witch hunting and diabolization, which includes the persecution of so-called heretics, like the Templars. But, as we shall hear, he dared stand up against the religious fanaticism of his own time, which wanted to preserve the Tyrol as a pure Catholic fortress against the rest of the world. For this, he was accused of treason. But, so, who was Josef Enemoser? He was born in 1787 in a remote hamlet at the very end of the Pasaya Valley, here in Tyrol, where he spent his childhood as a shepherd and cowherd. His father, a subsistence farmer, died when he was two, and so the boy was raised by his grandfather. Being a bright kid, the village priest encouraged him to continue his studies beyond elementary school. In 1809, Enemosa was 22 years old, and he enrolled to study medicine at the University of Innsbruck. Andreas Hofer, leader of the Tyrolean farmers that kept Napoleon troop at bay for almost eight months, made him his adjutant. He fought bravely and, as we know, in vain, as the Habsburgs surrendered to Napoleon and left the Tyrolians standing in the rain. Andreas Hofer was executed, 1810, and soon his fame spread all over Europe. Wordsworth dedicated four sonnets to him. Enemoser wanted to continue <coughs> his medical studies and landed in Berlin, where he immediately uh, was enrolled or made contact with anti-Napoleonic circles. In 1812, he was sent on a secret mission uh, to Britain to seek aid for the resistors. As an officer in Major Lützow's famous <coughs> Free Corps, Will, uh, Lützow's Wilde Verwegene Jagd, he led a company of Tyrolean sharpshooters and was later awarded the Iron Cross for his bravery. In 1816, he completed his doctorate with dissertation on the influence of mountains on human health. He knew something about that. <laughs> he got increasingly interested in the possibilities of curing patients with the help of animal magnetism. 
One of the mentors, uh, of his mentors, was the Jewish physician uh, David Korev, personal doctor of the Prussian <coughs> chancellor and a follower of Anton Mesmer and his theories. In 1819, Enemoser published his first book. And that same, year, that same year, he was appointed professor of magnetism at the newly founded University of Bonn. From 1819 to 37, he ran a medical practice. He cured famous patients, married, had two daughters, battled on many fronts for a more humane treatment of the mentally ill. Uh, after initial enthusiasms, mesmerism and animal magnetism came under increasing attack. <coughs> Enemoser became the target of vicious academic intrigues. He decided to leave the university and to return to Tyrol, where he hoped to make a living as a private practitioner. During one of his visits, he had expressed skepticism towards the widespread phenomenon of the so-called ecstatic, vir ecstatic virgins, who claimed to have visions, fall into trance, and, had, and who were regarded as saints by a large segment of the population. While Enemoser maintained that uh, there are enough miracles in nature, uh, and uh, he believed uh, the leaders of the clerical conservative forces claimed the ecstatic virgins were messengers sent by God to manifest the intention that Tyrol should remain a pure Catholic fortress, untainted by misbelievers, etc. Enemoser had made himself some powerful enemies, and when he moved to Innsbruck with his family in 1837, they did everything they could to make life difficult for him. He co-founded and became secretary of the Tyrolean Agricultural Society and their newsletter. He made many suggestions on how to improve soil fertility and grow more resistant crops. He encouraged, for example, farmers to grow more resistant potato crops. Uh, and different kinds of cereals, warned them that the future of viticulture lay in quality and not in quantity, and suggested varieties of grapes to grow. Uh, but most of all, he tried to convince them not to waste natural resources. For that purpose, he designed a new, more efficient kind of stove, which would enable families to save on wood. But all these activities did not generate an income, and every time he tried to launch himself into some new venture, like curing patients with salt uh, baths, invisible bureaucratic barriers would suddenly crop up and obstruct his project. He finally had to come to terms with the fact that the authorities and whoever was behind them was not going to let him make a living in Tyrol. So reluctantly, in 1841, he retreated to Munich, where he could count on a larger pool of patients. But in 1848, all of continental Europe was rocked by revolutions, and all the many despots, beginning with the Austro-Hungarian emperor, down to the myriad of little counts and dukes of Germany, had to make significant concessions. And one of them was an elected parliament that convened in Frankfurt to work on a new German constitution. The other one was freedom of the press. Enemoser didn't think twice. He rushed back to Tyrol and with his own personal funds founded the Innsbrucker Zeitung, a newspaper through which he and a few like-minded friends valiantly tried to propound the notion of civil rights, religious tolerance, freedom of speech in a society which considered all of these as threats to the authority of the emperor and of the church. We know all too well how the story ended. In June 1849, what remained of the Frankfurt Parliament, of which also Falmerayer was a member, was disbanded uh, militarily. Enemoser's newspaper was forced to close down by the uh, reinstated censorship authority in 1852. In 1854, the English translation of the History of Magic appeared. It is doubtful that Enemoser ever got to see a copy of it. He had started on his own autobiography, 
but managed only to write one first magnificent chapter on his childhood in the Tyrolean mountains. He died September 19th in Egern on the Hohen, uh, uh, Egern on Lake Tegernsee in Bavaria, where his tomb is still looked after today. In the years that followed, Enemoser was deliberately forgotten. The few encyclopedias where his name appeared ridiculized him as a quack. His archive was partly destroyed, partly scattered over Germany and Austria. In 1921, a young medical student, Jakob Brehm, wrote his inaugural dissertation on Enemoser. He was able to talk, talk to the last surviving descendants and to transcribe some documents which then went up in flames during World War II. Ironically, it was William Butler Yeats' interest in the history of magic and the fact that Ezra Pound remembered it in Pisa that led to a rediscovery of Enemoser in his own homeland in 2009 as part of the bicentennial celebration. The South Tyrolean History Museum of Schloss Tyrol uh, inaugurated an extensive special exhibit on Enemoser and his times entitled For Freedom, Truth and Justice, the motto of Enemoser's short-lived newspaper. A catalog appeared, a symposium was held, and in the course of three years we were able to locate the scattered remains of Enemoser's archive in over a dozen different collections and libraries, and his native village has just named a square after him all because of these tantalizing lines in Canto 83, preferring Enemoser on witches. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was fascinating. Uh, our next speaker is Katrina McCook. Uh, Katrina is a graduate of Clemson University, where she earned her master's degree in English. She moved from South Carolina to the West Coast in 2010, where she still pursues her love of literature through poetry and writing. Her primary research interests are modernism and how occult philosophy and methodology are applied in literature. She published her study on the occultist elements seen within the works of Ezra Pound, most noticeably focusing on the Pisan Cantos. So her paper is Pound's Occultism, the Development of Automatic and Occult Philosophy in the Pisan Context. Thank you. So I hope that we won't, we have a bit of crossover because I talk about Stone Cottage as well. Um, but that's where I set the foundation that Pound received the occult education, the, everything that he learned under Yeats, that's where it all started. Um, so let me just start. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? No. All right? No? <laughs> what about now? Better? Yes. Sort of? I'm sorry, I have a quiet voice. <clears throat> Despite being written some 30 years later, the Peas and Cantos are in part a product of the occult education Ezra Pound received in London between 1909 and 1916, one of the most influential occult figures in Pound's developing occultism was W.B. Yeats. During the Stone Cottage winters between 1913 and 1916, Pound served as secretary for Yeats and often accompanied him to various occultist meetings in London. Despite his fierce admiration for his mentor, Pound approached occult study and experimentation with a fair amount of reserve for what did not seem to him an altogether practical pursuit. <laughs> Nevertheless, because of his exposure to Yeats and the London occultists, Pound's writing shows obvious occult characteristics such as an, his inherent exclusivity, personalized form of automatic writing, and invocation of the dead. Under Yeats's guidance, Pound's academic pursuit of occultism influenced his writing and became a theme to which he often returned. Occult study, as we've discussed multiple times this week, has the regrettable problem of bestowing a sense of eccentricity to any author affiliated with it. Leon Surratt discusses this issue in his book, The Birth of Modernism, which is a great read if you've never uh, looked at it. He writes, like Pound's fascism, Yeats's occultism has been a subject not to be raised in polite company. Surratt attributes the lack of scholarly interest in studying modern occultism as an academic subject to its stigma of being taboo and misconstrued. 
In general usage, the definition of occultism encompasses the practice of magic for the purpose of gaining supernatural insight. For a scholarly interpretation, we use Demetrius Trifonopoulos' definition to mean the whole body of speculative, heterodox religious thought which lies outside all religious orthodoxies. As well, occultism involves the belief in the possibility of gnosis or direct awareness of the divine. Yeats's lifelong interest in occult study gave him connections between his strong sense of spiritualism, Irish nationalism, and religious upbringing. After establishing his friendship with Yeats, Pound began to develop his own interest in the, in the occult through a less romantic perspective than his mentor, preferring a more academic point of view. Pound cultivated his occult ideas based upon what Trifonopoulos calls the celestial tradition. This celestial tradition kind of combines the pursuit of of supernatural wisdom with the mythology of the ancient classics. The works of Dante, Homer, and other canonical writers provide Pound with recurring themes in his epic cantos, as well as his peasants. This proves his involvement with the occult movement in London is, large, is a largely unaccredited influence in his cantos. By employing the occult as a tool for scholarship rather than a zeitgeist in modern literature, the negative connotations it carries can be dispelled. Fascination with the occult had swept quickly across the literary landscape of Europe prior to Pound's 1908 arrival in London, where Yeats had already become an established practitioner of the occult. Yeats's curiosity about, about magic and all manner of occult subject led him to join Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical, Theosophical Society in 1897. The group's central doctrines were built around Eastern religions, from European occultism, mysticism, philosophy, and when it served their purpose, from science. Yeats became the head of the esoteric section, which studied secret symbols, themes between parts of the body, the seasons, the colors, elements, and the like. When his committee failed to produce a single magical result, despite Yeats's enthusiastic experimentation and research, he resigned. <laughs> The rituals Yeats took part in as a member of the Golden Dawn, which I think Anna mentioned the other day, um, led to what he calls visions. Um, if you, they're described as symbolic meditations. Uh, the visions were a precursor to Yeats's attempt at automatic writing. These meditations were meant for mediums to use their imaginations to dwell on ancient divinities who would ob often obligingly seem to take de de definite shape and to enlighten them on various aspects of the other world. As a result of these visions, Yeats began to keep a diary for his occult studies, which is testament to the level of sincerity with which he approached these practices. His continued research and experimentation only solidified his belief in the possibility of gaining knowledge from the spirits. Yeats's search for supernatural wisdom and enlightenment were well advanced by the time Pound attempted to make the acquaintance of the respected older poet. Being initiated into Yeats's exclusive inner circle bought, brought Pound a step closer to achieving his goal of modernizing poetry. In Pound's opinion, Yeats possessed the talent and connections he needed to introduce new life into the old and unfashionable modes of Victorian poetry. Pound made his rounds through meetings such as the Poets Club and the Irish Literary Society in an effort to establish himself as one of London's literati and acclaim a much desired invitation to Yeats's Monday evenings. This meeting is where the most exclusive group of poets gathered at Yeats' behest. After gaining an invitation to join this elite circle of artists and writers, Pound still felt as if he had not yet reached his full potential. Inspired by Yeats' earlier Rhymers Club, Pound organized his own exclusive two-man group, which he dubbed the Order of the Brothers Minor. The two-member group <laughs> consisted of only himself and Yeats, which significantly raised his status as one of London's newly distinguished modern poets. Despite having minted a friendship with Yeats, Pound did not begin his mentorship immediately. After his acceptance of Yeats's offer for a secretarial sort, of, secretarial sort of role at Stone Cottage, Pound wrote to his mother in dismay that he was afraid his time with Yeats would not be profitable due to the elder poet's ongoing investigations into psychic research. <laughs> Yeats's fascination with the supernatural did not coincide with what Pound deemed necessary for necessary study for modernizing poetry. But in an effort to please Yeats, Pounds initially assumed the role of interested and informed outsider. Even though he attended many gatherings of people interested in esoteric matters held by Yeats and his occult friends, Pound did not see himself, nor was he seen by them, as belonging. 
Nevertheless, Pound went to occult meetings with an open mind and concentrated on finding ideas to share with Yeats, such as his theories on symbolism and aesthetics. Although much of Pound's early career was spent amongst these occult groups, um, it is noted that Pound's occultism is largely overlooked by scholars and widely, under, uh, widely undervalued as a theme in his poetry. Pound's budding occultism began to thrive after he had been exposed to Yeats's research and occult acquaintances. Pound favored his occult connections because of the exclusivity these groups created amongst themselves. Um, Trifonopolis introduces the idea that it is Pound's elitist attitude rather than the thematic correspondence that encouraged his attendance at occult meetings. Uh, James Longebach's perspective closely mirrors my own that Pound's goal was to create a superior form of poetry to energize traditional Victorian composition. After his accepted into London's occult groups, Pound began an enduring interest in myth and initiation rituals. These subjects quickly became recurring themes within his poetry. In an effort to please Yeats and challenge himself with new subject matter, Pound became involved with publishing his article submissions to GRS Mead's magazine, The Quest. Uh, this outlines the relationship between Pound, is, Pound and Mead as one of teacher-student and that Pound's admiration for Mead was founded upon scholarship and his well-rounded occult knowledge. Pound succeeded in linking his occult and non-occult interests by fostering an attitude of exclusivity created with Yeats through mutual desire to modernize literature. Longenbach devotes a major point in his book Stone Cottage, a good read, to discussion of Yeats's and Pound's preference for maintaining exclusivity within their work in order to attain more authority within London's literary scene. Langenbach attributes this bond to a shared impulse to insult the world <laughs> with harsh criticism and similar arrogant attitudes. Pound's arrogance resulted from having Yeats as one of his primary influence. Yeats understood his pupil to be a fiery poet and a brash young man, not unlike himself, during his days as a political act activist and haughty Irish nationalist. Within the orders of the Brothers Minor, Yeats' voice was more dignified and experienced, which caused a bit of tension with his protege at times. Pound's need to promote exclusivity within his work gave him a certain amount of dominance over his literary peers, despite his inexperience and youth. He gleaned this approach from Yeats, whose desire for exclusivity in his work found fulfillment with the Golden Dawn's rites of initiation and levels of authority which granted access to occult secrets. The brief examination of the occult groups discussed here offers a glimpse into how difficult it may have been for Pound to access occult secrets, despite his close association with Yeats. After undergoing his own initiation, Pound adopted the occultist method of sharing select or secret knowledge as a tool for exclusivity to compose his poetry. Pound's understanding of occult exclusivity and select knowledge originate from an interest in historicism based on his readings of Dante, Homer, and the tomes of classic philosophers. These studies supplied Pound a natural accompaniment to Yeats's occultism. Pound discovered that the occult shares with literary modernism an interest in philosophy of history, in secret history, and in the history of religion and mythology. By combining myth, history, and secret knowledge in his writing, Pound construction constructs an environment of initiation into which he can bring his readers. He believed that to gain comprehensive understanding of a people or cultural or culture resulted from the directly from excuse me resulted from direct initiation of the reader. Pound's cantos are notoriously full of bits and pieces of news, languages, and references which the average reader might find challenging. Pound initially defended his voice of difficult material and the lack of understanding amongst his readers by saying, "You will never know either why I chose them or why they were worth choosing." or why you approve or disapprove my choice until you go to the text, to the originals. In his poems, Pound recreated the occult perspective that once a reader is initiated, then true understanding of the material will follow. Pound began writing his cantos in 1915 while under Gates's mentorship in London and the long poem spans over more than five decades. There are more than 120 completed poems aside from the numerous revisions and drafts. The myriad of subject matter in the cantos includes historical and at the time current events, Pound's ongoing autobiography, his political revelations, and at least six languages. 
Before World War II, Pound was working on the section known as his Italian cantos. These poems are written in Italian and include his approach to propagandistic material. From 1940 to 43, he had a bi-weekly radio broadcast supporting Mussolini's regime. regime. Deemed an American traitor, he was arrested in 1945 and sent to the American Disciplinary Training Center in Pisa. While incarcerated, Pound composed 10 poems published as the Pisan Cantos in 1948. His next session of the Cantos was written during his 13-year internment at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. These Cantos were published as The Rock Drill and Thrones, and are followed by the final chapter of the epic Drafts and Fragments of Cantos. After he was released on the grounds that he would not stand trial, Pound moved back to Italy. His final set of Cantos was published in 1969. There is no surprise that his formative years as a poet would be the most influential for Pound's development of the Cantos. Inspired by his occult education, Pound becomes the initiator while writing the Cantos. His primary motivation is belief that his readers must be cultured. Pound continued, Pound continued his epic Cantos when he was in prison from May to November 1945 at the American Detention Center. Pound's poem, including history, applies not only to the occult teachings of initiation and exclusivity, but also employs automatic writing as the method of composition. My analysis of the Pisan Cantos reveals that Pound's unique form of automatic writing is evident through his visions, secondary personality, spirit guides, and invocation of the dead. For automatic writing to occur, the medium or writer must be receptive to creative and supernatural influences. In an automatic writing session, the primary goal of the medium is to produce writing inspired by supernatural or spiritual influence. Automatic writing can assume several formats, including freehand drawings, abbreviated phrases, and multilingual composition. Automatic writing is defined to be writing performed without conscious thought or deliberation, typically by means of spontaneous free association or as a medium for spirits or psychic forces. The primary objective is to discern a subconscious or spiritual meaning from thought processes not always fully understood or accessible to the writer. A more experienced writer can serve as a medium for the spirits. This is summarized as chiefly a matter of suspending conscious use of the faculties. Traditionally, automatic writing emphasizes a shared ancestral memory, which is one source for the select knowledge the spirits may share in a session. During his London years, Pound became familiar with occult experimentation, including automatic writing, its connection to the medium's identity and autobiographical nature. On more than one occasion, he witnessed Yeats and his fellow occultists hold seances and practice automatic writing for the purpose of divination or prophecy. Even amongst occult circles, Yeats was sometimes regarded as having a peculiar obsession with the occult. In The Birth of Modernism, Leon Surratt points out that many writers in the modernist clique tried to disassociate themselves directly with occult activities. He writes, Pound, Joyce, and Eliot are all on the record with disparaging remarks about Yeats's ghosts. <laughs> Despite the cold reception to all things magical and mystical, Yeats and his closest occult associates engrossed themselves in automatic writing and his sister activity, the seance, in their quest for divine knowledge. Yeats firmly believed that life carries on in the spirit world, which emphasizes that the spirit is never value neutral and always seeks to sustain or reinforce the beliefs of the sitter and or the medium. As Yeats grew more experienced in occult experiments, he desired a more personal way to communicate with the spirit world in addition to regular seances and other psychic tests. He dedicated himself to automatic writing for the purpose of charting the odyssey of the soul. The need to gain access to the spiritual realm drove Yeats to seek communication with the spirits by assisting his wife, who became a medium during their automatic writing sessions. Their results are documented in what became Yeats's A Vision. Yeats' earlier studies had produced Per Amica Silentia Lune, written as a summary of, of his belief in the afterlife, the role of a demon, and encounters with the spirit of Leo Africanus. Yeats, his wife, and even Pound gave their study of the occult a sense of academic purpose. Although Pound did not embrace his occult education as a fully spiritual experience, Yeats was able to make connections between his faith and occult studies. At Stone Cottage, Pound generally held himself aloof from many of Yeats's occult practices since he had dedicated his attention to the Fenelosa papers, but he gained familiarity with its purpose as Yeats grew more deeply involved in his studies. 
These ongoing tests with automatic writing took Yates more than two years to complete beginning in 1912. In this experiment, Yates endeavored to ask questions by method of telepathic communication and have them answered by writing one of his automatic writing participants. He became unfailingly convinced that a living mind could serve as a medium for departed spirits. This test is among many that Yates conducted while sharing a close association with Pound in London. Although Pound never became fully ingrained in the occult as his mentor did, he found value in retaining elements from his occult educations. Um, and he remembers his stone cottage days in the Peas and Cantos, when in Canto 83, he thinks of Uncle William downstairs composing. As Yeats's secretary, Pound's duties included reading aloud to the elder poet. There's little surprise that Yeats preferred Anna Moser's text over the romantic Wordsworth. Anna, Anna Moser's book includes investigation into animal magnetism and occult science, which would have been a primer for Yeats and Pound, who were scientifically illiterate. The occult sciences were an aside to Yeats's progression in psychic research when Elman, Richard Elman writes as a, was a product of his quest to find irrefutable evidence of the supernatural. Pound took an interest in reading those occult texts alongside Yeats and developed a more latent occultism which was exposed in his cantos. The occult education Pound underwent more than 30 years prior to his imprisonment in 1945 is an, an important factor in the composition of the Pisan cantos. The occult overtones of the Pisans are generally ignored in favor of discussing Pound's politics and autobiography. Sorry. James Longenbach addresses the underlying question as to other motivations for composing the Pisan cantos. He writes, the Pisans are Pound's autobiography, his own genealogy of the dream of nobility, of nobility, but his legacy is inherently tied to Yeats. Since even Yeats is not mentioned in the Pisan cantos, he does appear more often than any other ghost. The presence of his sensibility is always felt. Pound lists the ghosts whose presence he is aware of when he's writing the Pisan cantos, including in Canto 74, 40, that road of giants, and William, who dreamed of nobility, and Jim, the comedian, singing. He also notes in this passage that there are shades of Ford Maddox Ford, W.B. Yeats, James Joyce, Victor Plar, Edgar Jepson, Maurice Hewlett, and Sir Henry Newbolt. These men are all part of Pound's aristocracy of the arts that lived on well past his London years. This proves that modernism and occultism both share the same elitist approach the acceptance of secret histories and pursuit of wisdom within their respective canons. Pound wrote the cantos based on secret history while weaving the Odyssey into its fabric to complete the formula for his epic. Yeats once said that Pound's epic ambition was constantly interrupted, broken, twisted into nothing by its direct opposite, nervous obsession, nightmare, and stammering confusion. <laughs> but he wouldn't be put off. Yeats' analysis of Pound's work offers a deeper understanding of the poet who has relinquished himself to become a medium for his ghosts and the dream of an epic legacy within his Pisans. The ghosts who haunt the Pisan cantos guide Pound from the road to hell and onto the path toward a meditative close as the poet becomes possessed by the Odyssean spirit as he believes death is imminent. In Canto 80, from this point forward, it has a sort of death chill as noted in Canto 80, line 33, which translates into automatic script and the conjuring of the ghosts of friends and colleagues. Pound's use of his Odyssean spirit is a conscious application of a developed secondary personality. The terms personality and mask are used interchangeably because of their varying interpretations in Poundian scholarship. Most studies of automatic writing usually support the possibility of a secondary personality as a type of shield for the medium's hidden emotions. This is mass theory functions in an almost identical manner by allowing the author to escape duress or trauma or persecution through the protection of a mask. From an academic or scientific perspective, automatic writing is more than just a tool to contact spirits or to gain super knowledge, supernatural knowledge and guidance, such as Yates and his wife intended. In her scientific exploration of automatic writing, Dr. Anita Mule finds that the practice does not have to be mysterious or a curious endeavor. Mule's work as a psychoanalyst led her to practice the study of automatic writing as a therapeutic tool, and she published her findings in 1930. 
The perception upheld by Mule is that automatic <laughs> writing can be utilized as a way to clear the mind. The practice is influenced by the writer's personality, experiences, and memories. Pound's contribution to the scholarly argu argument surrounding occultism and automatic writing is largely based on his approach. It's his adamant opinions about the necessary changes required to modernize literature and art that makes his poetry the foundation for modernism. Aside from the obvious experimental aspects to composing an automatic script, Pound is a proponent for making literature and poetry new by employing different techniques and theories. Pound's theory of the occultist birth and death cycle palingenesis is directly connected to his use of automatic writing. He takes traditional occult practice and reinvents it as a method for composing poetry. While writing the Pisan Cantos, Pound uses automatic writing as a therapeutic tool in addition to channeling a seance and bringing forth ghosts. The seemingly nonsensical jumble of subjects in the Pisans assumes a more coherent structure when viewed through the lens of automatism. Automatic writing can function as a way to dispel personal fears since the act of automatic writing is a tool for releasing emotional energy. As a rule, automatic speech and writing display nothing more than revivifying of faded mineral imagery, thoughts, conjectures, and impressions, which never come to birth in the upper consciousness. With this method, a writer can access hidden feelings or memories which give an autobiographical or narrative focus to their sessions. The unfamiliar surroundings of the detention camp put Pound in a morbid and rapidly dis disintegrating state of mind. He seeks hope and solace in the figures of nymphs, muses, and ghosts that shield him from his view of hell. The muses Dursa, Isoda, and Giovanna are symbols that Pound grasps as he feels helpless among the cages of the DTC. Through the filter of automatic writing, Pound is calling forth spirits who can aid him in his passage through hell. <laughs> Within a few weeks of his imprisonment, Pound loses his hope of freedom and his thoughts <clears throat> turn towards the possibility of death. In these lines, he falters between faith in the painted paradise between his prison walls and the damnation of hell. Another primary component for automatic writing is the personality and identity of the writer. Pound uses these characters to portray himself under the shroud of a mythical hero and ghost, ghostly spirit guide Odysseus. Pound's ideal mask is the illusion of the hidden hero. Um, in the Pisan Cantos, the poet's own self, have, having been largely absorbed into a mask, the siege and translation in earlier cantos for the first time appears on this stage in his poems, a histrionic image that comes naturally to the pen and has an odd appropriateness. To summon a large number of ghosts from varying histories and traditions to this writing of the cantos, Pound needed a method for easy transition, making the mass tool particularly effective and removing himself directly. Pound develops his hero identity through Odysseus's spirit and uses his mass regularly throughout the cantos. These many sides of himself come together in the chaos of his Pisans, which, are struggled, which is a similar to the struggle Yeats endured with the self and anti-self. From the first canto in the Pisans, Pound identifies himself through this Odysse Od Odyssean spirit. This merging of personalities, spirit guides, and opinions consistently reappears throughout the Pisans, as Pound's defense against his journey through, through the hell of the DTC. Pound writes from the perspective of, of Odysseus, who is battle-weary and far from home. He shares with Odysseus a feeling of diaspora. Pound's feeling of displacement shares similarities with Homer's hero, whose idealism and resolve is unwavering despite his situation. By continually asserting, reasserting his Odyssean spirit guide, Pound navigates the difficult terrain of his Pisans and his environment. Pound learned from Yeats that to successfully integrate oneself into automatic writing is necessary to have a spirit guide. Pound puts his Odyssean mask as his guide ere others destroy him. He naturally uses this figure in his automatism because the Homeric spirit had already been with him this whole time, in his cantos and in the poet's mind for many years. As his life seems just past hope, and his imprisonment wears on him, Pound calls forth ghosts and spirits in a seance meant to help him preserve his memories. Throughout the Pisans, Pound constantly encounters the world of the dead. He communes with the ghosts in the seance he hosts in the Pisan cantos. For six months, Pound tries to find his paradise and allows the suave-eyed goddesses to guide him there. Pound's occultism reaches its climax as he conducts the seance that his automatic writing calls forth.
So we have uh, about 35 minutes for questions. So, questions. Uh, I was, uh, uh, <coughs> from Iceland, we are building a new university hospital, <coughs> and uh, it's supposed to be somehow patient-oriented, so it's there to like, get away, you know, get rid of all the corridors, so it would be somehow very special. Uh, based on this notion that all hospitals should be places of worship, do you have any suggestions of how we could for me to bring back and say, well, now it's an opportunity for us to really, through the architecture, through whatever, to, to turn this place into a, something very new and beautiful. And practical. <laughs> yes, of course, you have to keep in mind uh, <clears throat> what Inemoser was starting from. Uh, and that was the, you know, the classic image of the Naranturm, where mentally ill persons were just simply locked up, as we know, in absolute dismal conditions. And um, so, any uh, and in that at that time there were, were some pioneers who were trying to. Uh, have a totally different approach and it began essentially with people who uh, thought, you know, what would be the proper location for an given house so that it would be a matter of locating it close in a beautiful ambience out in nature, the healing powers of nature and close to, you know, water and to have also, uh, you know, they were thinking very much about the possibilities of uh, the healing powers of activity, especially rural activities, therefore also working with the land, planting, growing, things that are, to a certain extent, have been now incorporated into, into this, uh, into also modern or more modern clinics, at least in some cases. I mean, this is it's certainly not, you know, it's, it's, if you go to New Jersey <laughs> mental state institution, you're not going to find that. You, know, you will find bingo and, and things like that yeah. and, to distract people and so on. But uh, in the days, Animal Sir was in touch and there is a big correspondence with uh, the other, um, not Theodor Körner, but from Weinberg. Uh, anyway, uh, a contemporary of his who had uh, essentially tried to heal, again, uh, mental disturbances through music and had also developed the water organ, water pipes as a special ways and everybody who came to visit him and so on. So it's, um, uh, I think if one goes back to these different authors who at the time were, and you know, there were, there were experiments in France, there were experiments in Austria, and, uh, who were actually trying to create a humane uh, healing space, uh, you, you would probably find some concrete ideas there which may not be terribly original to that extent, but which at least uh, see that people have actually thought about this before, and it is probably because we have lost track of that and have gone in a direction of, you know, just putting people, sedating them or whatever, everything that goes against the main um, tenet of this group of, of, shall we say, of medicine sorcerers that the powers of healing are inside you and that it is the job of the doctor, psychiatrist, whatever, to actually get those powers out again. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sidi, uh, I remember that now in turn that Joseph II, the son of um, 
Maria Theresia built up in Vienna. He built it as a machine where he collected the power of the mentally ill to transform it into a form of, of observatory that he used to get in touch with his spirits, with the spirits of the two uh, Maria Theresias, with his beloved and early dying daughter and his hated mother, where he needed uh, the support to go on as an emperor, but he never learned to be because his mother didn't let him. But he did this beautiful architecture as a real machine uh, that had been dismounted in the end. There was a cancel on the rooftop where he was sitting the whole night being in contact mm. with those two spirits. Huh. I think there are drawings of that Narnturm, no? And they look still, pretty. They look pretty. Exists, it, they look exists, pretty dismally exists, cruel, and you know, uh, a use of the misery of of these poor people for his own purpose. I don't know if he was moved by any noble attempt to actually do something good to the patients. I have my doubts there. <laughs> I wish to express my thanks to Katrina for opening my mind a bit to Ezra Pound because I've always heard of him on around the edges. And while you were speaking, I wondered if you have ever um, found any connections between Ezra Pound and Nietzsche, to who I'm not very knowledgeable about him, but certainly characteristics? I haven't gone, I didn't go that direction with my study. There's certainly been some academic research uh -huh. in that direction, of course, because okay. there's, there's natural ties, natural themes. Um, yeah, what I found is that the Pisan cantos seem to be on the periphery of a lot of studies of the cantos. It is difficult material if you just open the pages and just, you know, flip over it looks <laughs> like this. So there's three different languages at the start of this canto. Three. And so you have to, unless you can actively read all three languages, one of which is Chinese, then you're going to need some translation. Um, so no, that's very interesting. But the, uh, the translations and the automatic writing studies took up most of my, most of my efforts. But that's certainly an interesting, an interesting subject. With, with translations, that's been a big part of my life, and often how different the texts are in different languages. Mm -hmm. It goes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Yeah, uh, Katrina, um, I'm just wondering if you could say some things about what personally drew you to found in this milieu, you know, uh, to engage with it so deeply and just a bit more about about what it means to you personally. What I found, I was um, when I was in grad school, I took a class on, it was just modernist literature, just a comprehensive overview, if you will. And we came across um, Pound as a part of the curriculum. And our professor read, uh, well, was asked us to buy the Peas and Cantos, the book. Um, and we only used a very small part of, one of the cantos. So I started reading. I read through the whole thing and it was fascinating because other than everyone talks about E.E. E. Cummings and how untraditional his method of writing poetry is, even the Pisan cantos stand apart from the rest of the cantos. It's very unique. Um, and so in order to fully understand or to get myself initiated into what Pound is trying to say, then a lot of it, like I mentioned, you have to go through the translations. And at that point, it's just so engrossing because you must reach the end to see, does he, does he reach his paradise? You know, what conclusion does he get to at the very end of this? Um, you know, it's quite the journey. And once you understand, um, or you have the translations for all the languages that you don't speak, um, then it's a very interesting, unique journey. 
And what I found too is that in academia, there is not very much information on automatic writing. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a fringe subject, if you will. And I think that's been brought up multiple times this week to where it's, if you want to study it properly in academia, it's a sort of, it's like a, oh, sort of reaction. So, <laughs> um, so I felt like it was sort of my duty to tie together some of the occult themes that I saw in the Pisan Cantos, in addition to just giving it its due um, and to study it and to put out there my thoughts in combination with some of the traditional Poundian scholars um, that I found shared the same themes or shared the same ideas. Um, so that's basically where it started. But even still, I can go back and just pick up anywhere, and it's still just as engrossing as the first time I read it. Uh, Katrina, I was on the, on the topic of uh, automatic writing and fringe subjects in academia. I wonder if you came, up, came upon uh, Jung's On the Spirit of Man, Art, and Literature in his um, article, I guess it was a talk, on the relation of psychoanalysis and poetry. Because in that, he very directly addresses what we would probably call automatic writing. He says something. Uh, the effect of the, the work forces itself upon the poet. Uh, its form comes with it. The poet has no control over the form. Every time he tries to enforce his will on the poem, it is thrust back at him. Um, so it's this really, really beautiful and interesting essay on what I think we think of as automatic writing or uh, what channeling from the outside. Mm -hmm. Have you ever come? I haven't, no, but that's really interesting that you say that, because uh, that's throughout the entirety of the Peas and Cantos, he, he's bringing forth the ghosts of people that either he knew well or not, um, and it's almost as if they're accompanying him through this journey. You know, they're right there with him, surrounding them, they're speaking to him. So no, that's really interesting. I'll definitely look that up and take a read. But that's the thing, too, is that in psychoanalysis and in academia, Jung is fringe right. as well. Yeah. Like, he, like, there's all the other strains of psychoanalysis, and then the Jungians are over there, and they that's don't right. really talk. <laughs> other questions? I'm not sure if it's exactly a question form yet, but uh, but for Sigrid, I just really appreciated um, uh, you telling about Anamosa and, and it's sort of like this this journey of almost like a ancestor veneration in the sense of of this um, of how it wasn't until his death and somehow through Esther Pound that he was able to sort of come back to his own homeland and be respected. So so fascinating. Um, and I guess I'm just curious uh, if there's any other other ways you personally feel to feel your own um, mythology intersecting with with this land here. Like just a, like a sort of a broad question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of. Bizarre because, uh, on one hand, um, if you Google magic or witches, you're going to come up with Enemosa's history of magic. So it's, in a sense, it's become, you know, it was it was it was more or less also rapaciously used by Madame Blavatsky, and and so has, in some ways, entered into a sort of mainstream of sorts. Uh, but Enemosa has written so much more and so many different, you know, his, his approaches uh, are so many, manifold. Uh, the very fact of trying to, uh, you know, his dissertation about the effect of mountains, of climate, on the well being of people, uh, there are, you know, and, and the questions of, he, he because he was a shepherd and cowherd as a young boy, he was absolutely convinced that uh, cows had souls, that uh, they had personality, you know, 
personalities, etc., etc. So he, his his appreciation of animals and the dignity of animals. Uh, there are so many fields where it appears he was really, you know, doing pioneering work, uh, which unfortunately sort of wasn't picked up locally or is maybe being picked up now, you know, through many different uh, routes. And uh, so I think there is a place where all of these great characters will probably uh, gather and meet and uh, have a good time and say, uh, you, know, you know, I had this idea way back then and um, you were just over on the other side of the valley and we didn't ever meet <laughs> and things like that. And uh, it, I presume that the, um, the, the fact that articulating as is being done in such symposia it is what uh, really um, Enemoso was also trying to do because you see he's carrying on the speech uh, healing not just patients but looking at all of society as a patient that needs to be healed mm -hmm. so he is obviously right there on the forefront when it comes you know to political matters, to fight for the freedom of speech, for equal rights, civil rights, and so on. Mm -hmm. If that Frankfurt, you know, the, 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 the <coughs> German constitution that was actually uh, deliberated and approved in the Frankfurt parliament, which included minority rights, which included women's rights, which included all kinds of things that, uh, and most of all, religious tolerance and freedom tolerance. Just imagine, you know, of course, what would have happened or would not have happened if Germany had adopted that. You know, all of that, of course, that was adopted after the Second World War. So it took two wars mm -hmm. to get those dreams actually to take shape, but you know, a lot of tragedy in between. Yeah. So yes, now I think we have to remember, and that's what Pound does, uh, trying to keep his mind entire, which has many different things, because it's a quote from Tiresias, who hath his mind entire, and therefore, you know, you, it is through memory, dovesta memoria, that you keep your mind entire, that you, as it were, reconstruct that world that in some ways otherwise like Vagadu, Frobenius's city, which lives only in the hearts of the people, uh, that this African legend of the city of Vagadu, it's all part of that trying to reconstruct something to reestablish this ineffable world. Mm -hmm. And it is a world of definitely in which memory plays a fundamental role. Mm -hmm. So I would say that memory and automatic writing are very close there in, 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 in the general realm of tools and work that are... It's an interesting building on that, just the, the studies of memory itself, that the more you remember a memory, the more inaccurate it becomes, because we rewrite it and embellish it, which compared with automatic writing or, or anything of this matter, the more you meditate and fix, you are affecting it and therefore changing it as well. It's just an interesting parallel. Yeah, but uh, of course, as you remember, what uh, Circe keeps telling Odysseus is remember to remember. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically that remembering is exactly what makes art, makes the poem possible. Re because the poem is being told as a memory. And then it's being told as a prophecy. And only once is it it's been told as it's happening. Yeah. But yeah. so basically, you know, it's, it's this continuous fluidum of telling a story and you can tell it as a prophecy and you can tell it as a memory. It doesn't really matter. It's all <laughs> one same dimension. Mm -hmm. Al, and then behind that. I was delighted in the first paper to, to, to briefly uh, hear the, the shout out to John Hayden uh, in the uh, Influence and Animosa. 
Uh, he's, he's one of my favorite dead geomancers. Uh, <laughs> and he also, I was, I, I was then thinking that he, he does crop up in, uh, I had to look it up, Canto 3, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the early ones, uh, and uh, Pound calls him that, that, that half cracked fellow. Um, uh, an accusation he was constantly, uh, uh, and, and has since uh, faced a lot from uh, uh, historians and, and things. I was wondering about, uh, you spoke of uh, Pound uh, and his relationship to the ghosts of his friends and his, his, you know, his aristocracy mm. he was forming. Uh, I, I wonder if you've encountered more of him reflecting on uh, uh, more historical uh, magicians. Uh, and, 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 and the cultists. In the Pisan Cantos? Mm. Um, no, they seem to be, for the most part, people that he knew. I, Like I said, either closely or just acquaintances that he remember were influential somehow for him. Um, so it, the first time I read it, I was like, oh, well, he's just, he's just name dropping. That's what it seems like. You know, all these folks were very important for different reasons, artists or poets, what have you, writers. Um, but then going back to look at it, I said, no, he, he had a relationship of some kind with all of these people, for the most part, closely. Um, and so to him, he's, he's surrounding himself with folks that mattered a lot to him, even if perhaps they didn't know how important they were, that he would be in one of the most difficult um places physically in his life and mentally that they were there with him and I found that really interesting. Could I just add Please. to Hayden? Yes. <laughs> I mean Hayden is called the secretary of nature mm -hmm. in the cantos so he places Hayden into his paradiso in one of his fragments of paradise as secretary of nature so we obviously have a high estimation and looked at him as such. I wonder about the, the relationship of, of Hayden being one of the few self-proclaiming Rosicrucians. Uh, <laughs> the idea of uh, exclusivity may have appealed. Uh, in some sense. For those of you who, well, uh, you won't have time, but the next time that you come to <coughs> South Tyrol, you must go, of course, up to Schloss Tyrol because there are the portals. These are some of the most beautiful Romanesque portals that you will find in, in the Alps. But uh, uh, Josef von Hammer Purkstall, uh, he wrote an interpretation of these portals. Uh, he was convinced that they were Gnostic secret symbols and that the te Knight Templars were behind it. He was convinced that the Templars were still doing uh, kind of conspiracies and so on, and he was. Uh, very much of a, uh, though on one hand uh, himself a victim of conspiracy theories by Metternich, who kept preventing uh, Hammer Purkstall from creating the uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences, he himself uh, had this idea that all of these various uh, essentially Christian symbols were actually Gnostic symbols and Templars, and the Templars were still up uh, and, and active. Bahomet and so on. He wrote a book about Bahomet. Yeah, I have a question for Katarina. I can see you. Oh. <laughs> you mentioned mask theory and uh, the need to create uh, a parallel persona or different personas to not be traumatized. Mm -hmm. I was wondering sure I have I have a list if you want formally. I, can, I can definitely provide that to you yeah anyone else should we call it then let's call it and thank you for this wonderful first panel yeah yes. yes. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a talk from the conference Rewriting the Future, 100 Years of Esoteric Modernism and Psychoanalysis. First was Siegfried de Rauschewitz, 
giving a welcome talk to the Brunenberg and then his paper on Joseph Ennemoser and animal magnetism. Then we had Katrina McCook on Pound's occultism and the development of automatic writing in his occult philosophy in the Pisan Cantos and moderated by Cadmus Herschel. For more, please visit the conference website, psychartcult.org. That's P-S-Y-C-H-A-R-T-C-U-L-T dot org. You can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast website, Rendering Unconscious, org rendering unconscious is also a book rendering unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives politics and poetry published by Trapart books 2019 and also available as an ebook through ibooks and kindle for more information, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T R A P A R T.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P A T R E O N.com forward slash V A N E S S A. 2 3 C A R L Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. And now, opening doors we didn't know existed. Thank you.